It's being brought to us today by Noah Novgrodsky, who's a Carl Williams Professor of Law and Ethics at the University of Wyoming College of Law. Uh, he is, uh, has written, teaches international human rights, public international law, immigration law, and civil procedure. Uh, he has a wide uh, array of interests in international relations and has had a number of appointments at Cambridge University and, and uh, other um, uh, international posts. Uh, before going into teaching, he was a, an associate uh, at uh, Arnold and Porter. Uh, he is the founding director of the International, has been the founding director of the International Human Rights Clinic at the University of Toronto. Uh, and he's also been a visiting professor at Georgetown, Connecticut, and Berkeley. And his scholarship is also focused on uh, HIV AIDS uh, pandemic, and international criminal justice, and transnational human rights problems. So it's a pleasure to welcome Noah Novogrosky here today for our faculty talk. Thank you very much. I, I think I really owe this uh, invitation to my wife, who was a classmate of the deans at uh, <laughs> Harvard. And uh, we became friends in Cambridge and, um, uh, and remained uh, connected ever since. Uh, so thank you very much to uh, Ruth and Dan for inviting me, for Ohio for organizing uh, uh, today's talk. I've circulated a 20-page draft that is just that. It's a draft. Um, it's a project I'm beginning to write and work on. And I welcome any and all criticism, suggestions, and uh, thoughts. Uh, I do not have a PowerPoint, so I'm just going to speak from notes, and maybe I will point powerfully to the uh, screen. <laughs> uh, international and comparative law scholars have written extensively about the migration of constitutional norms and the practice of high courts engaged in borrowing or cross-referencing decisions from foreign courts. About 10 or 12 years ago, this was a really hot and contentious topic. But less attention has been paid to the question of how effective transnational advocacy occurs, particularly in the area of human rights. And based on recent experiences litigating uh, Obergefell and Hobby Lobby, the uh, contraceptive coverage cases, before the Supreme Court, the draft I have distributed examines how lawyers marshal arguments and favorable case law across jurisdictions to facilitate the adoption or uptake of ideas, particularly when the court doesn't have to. So that is uh, seminal to my argument. My tentative conclusion is that winning transnationalism requires three things. Number one is a direct appeal to first principles, rather than a scorecard the number of states that have adopted a particular position. Number two, I think it is critical to translate foreign and comparative discourse into well-tested domestic legal norms. And three, this is a pitch that has to be made to judges, not legislatures, to embrace a uniquely judicial function. I think I have a, uh, a particular a valuable vantage point in that I have litigated human rights cases in a number of national courts and international tribunals, first as the director of the International Human Rights Clinic at the University of Toronto Law School, and more recently at the center I run at the University of Wyoming. A few points to begin with. The most successful migration or borrowing of foreign and comparative law happens when one court decides to learn from the experiences of another country. So we're not talking about international tribunals, which invoke international, foreign, and even scholarly writings into their analysis. For example, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court and Commission is, by its very nature, open to diverse inputs as it interprets international legal obligations pursuant to a convention that references more than the, uh, the founding document itself. And of course, I'm not talking about the informal advocacy and 
sharing that happens between lawyers and uh, advocates working on a range of issues. Um, there has been a proliferation, for example, of uh, HIV, AIDS, antiretroviral therapy workshops on how to learn from South Africa and Brazil and win expanded coverage of life-saving medicine in diverse countries. Um, that's not the kind of grassroots mobilizing advocacy that I'm talking about. Uh, what interests me is how lawyers influence domestic judicial decisions when the court need not, but often does, look to foreign and comparative law. And this is a bone to Dean Hamilton, but the migration of constitutional norms begins with the Commonwealth tradition of harmonizing laws across an empire upon which the sun never set. So it is no surprise that tiny Belize or Sierra Leone would look to the High Court of Australia or the Canadian Supreme Court to resolve the question of whether Mayan communities hold Aboriginal title to lands they have traditionally used in occupy or that Lord Mansfield would canvas Blackstone's commercial law to avoid an insurance contract, as he did in the case of the Zong, involving a, uh, a notorious claim on behalf of slavers who threw human cargo overboard and then submitted a, uh, a commercial insurance claim to Lloyd's of, of England. And Lord Mansfield was basically dealing with insurance fraud. Uh, he didn't talk about it in terms of mass murder, but he looked to the law of the Caribbean, to the West Indies, to uh, the East India Trading Company to find that uh, the case in controversy in front of him was uh, void because of Commonwealth common law well settled principles. Let's call the Commonwealth tradition transnationalism 1.0. And in this historical tradition, we tend to have more borrowing happening in less developed, developed judiciaries from more developed judiciaries. More recently, progressive human rights advocates have sought to extend norms and principles from a place that has adopted their preferred viewpoint to one that has not. So for this proposition, look no further than the case I cite in my brief, which is that uh, Harold Coe at Yale Law School, with former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Mary Robinson, submitted a brief in Lawrence versus Texas. And there, Amiki argued, or urged the United States Supreme Court to follow the European Court of Human Rights decision in Dudgeon which struck down a law banning consent of the same-sex intimacy. Justice Kennedy's decision did just that, and cites Dudgeon approvingly as confirmation of the court's due process reasoning. He actually cut and paste a full page of the amicus brief and inserts it into a Supreme Court decision, which, as you know in our line of work, is the gold standard for uh, the uptake of ideas. Liberals were elated and conservatives were shocked and appalled. And the story used to be that conservative voices claimed that what happens outside of our unique legal community is irrelevant to the resolution of the case. This, of course, was the source of Justice Scalia's comment that it is, quote, the US Constitution we are expounding upon and not any other foreign nation. An analogous situation developed in Australia and India, whose high courts are prone to saying that what happens elsewhere in the world is non justiciable and a matter for Parliament to decide. So let's call liberal internationalists shopping, substantive shopping, not foreign shopping, you know, bringing law from a jurisdiction where they like an outcome. And conservatives saying, no, 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 you can't do this. Transnationalism 2.0. Uh, that dynamic did not hold. 
Federalist Society and other uh, more conservative legal groups immediately generated a backlog, a backlash among like-minded politicians and judicial authorities, evidence most famously in Justice Scalia's decision <coughs> versus Simmons, in which he asserted that, quote, the basic premise of the court's argument that American law should conform to the laws of the rest of the world ought to be rejected out of hand. I actually love reading Justice Scalia in dissent because he is unchecked. <laughs> Rover was followed by Graham versus Florida, which used international comparative law to ban life sentences for juveniles for crimes not involving murder. But in a related 2012 case, Miller versus Alabama, the court studiously avoided discussion of any non-US sources. At the same time, politically conservative politicians passed legislation purporting to ban the application of Sharia law in places like Oklahoma began to ask judicial nominees to pledge that they would never cite foreign and comparative law as the basis for future decisions. The result has been a kind of underground movement among more progressive or liberal justices, most vocally uh, Justice Breyer, who continue to cite foreign and comparative law, but insist that it's not binding, it's simply educational or influential. And now conservatives are emboldened, or this era were emboldened, to say that uh, it is malpractice merely to reference foreign ideas. Nikki Jackson called this tension the engagement with the transnational, and noted that justices, particularly at the United States Supreme Court, fell somewhere between adoption and outright resistance. So let's call the backlash era transnationalism 3.0. And most recently, conservatives have changed their tune. Instead of saying that they shouldn't, that the court ought not to look to foreign and international law, they have joined those of us who are in a more liberal camp, and they are doing it both guns blazing. In three cases, a coalition of amici organized by BYU law professors have taken the position that foreign and comparative law means that the United States Supreme Court ought not to recognize same-sex marriage, that it should recognize religious objections to contraceptive coverage, and that the death penalty is just fine because other countries adopt it. Their basic argument is that their views are, quote, fully compatible with international norms and case law. That is no different than what liberal internationalists have been doing. The briefs carefully qualify the salience of international practice. So in Obergefell, BYU brief said, of course, foreign law and practice cannot and should not determine the meaning of U.S. constitutional guarantees. The foreign and comparative experience stands as an empirical resource, a lesson for the court to do with what they do. <coughs> Why do I know that they use this particular paragraph? Because I wrote it in the brief that was filed two weeks earlier. And so they cited my language in you know, the Obergefell brief that I submitted, and are in complete agreement that international comparative law is not binding, but it is nonetheless persuasive. So now, this body of law is being used on both sides of the debate, and I'm trying to understand when it works and when it doesn't. So let's call this transnationalism formal. And one explanation is that it depends on who submits the brief. So respected organizations and individuals might gain traction for their views, but fringe voices do not. And there may be some truth in this, but I'm suspicious of the argument because it ignores the craft and substance of a growing practice. So instead, I, I have identified three admittedly self-serving factors that I think contribute to winning transnationalism. Why do I call it winning transnationalism? Because we've been winning in these cases 
where the court does look to foreign and international law. And where the court does not look to it, we claim a draw. So that, again, is you know, kind of a, uh, in particular, gloss on it. So the first argument I make in the paper is that any court that doesn't have to follow precedent directly is going to be more interested in an actionable reference to values or ideas that exist both within and outside the state and that speak to our first principles. To do so requires the advocate to address the reasoning behind things like international human rights treaties, use coaches, norms, or explain why a decision is likely to echo from one jurisdiction into another. This is the dialogic appeal, and it obviously plays better in those cases involving matters that have consequences beyond the state's borders. Citizenship and immigration, indigenous rights, same-sex marriage involving partners of different nationalities, reproductive freedom, particularly where women are being pushed to terminate pregnancies in other countries, internet speech, uh, universal crimes, all issues that I think exceed the interest or capability of any one state to fully regulate. And here, comparisons matter. Plainly, some countries and contexts count more than others. And the trend matters as well. In Obergefell, we argued with great effect that uh, the Irish referendum on same-sex marriage, that it happened uh, after the initial briefs were filed, but before the Supreme Court decision came down in June of 2015. Remember, at that time, the United States Supreme Court was six Catholics and three Jews. In fact, Neil Gorsuch is the only Protestant on the court. So again, appealing to Dean Hamilton's uh, legal history, I'm, I'm guessing this is an anomalous situation, that uh, we have had some wasps on the court for a long time, and, uh, uh, and that uh, a predominantly Catholic court is a new phenomenon, and one, frankly, uh, where the Catholic precedent from Spain, Portugal, Argentina, and Ireland can be uh, particularly important. The BYU brief basically tallies up all the countries in the world that uh, don't accept same-sex marriage and said the United States Supreme Court should feel comfortable doing the same. And we said, the 25 countries that we are most like do accept same-sex marriage, and that what we really need to talk about is a trend and a relevant comparator rather than uh, uh, a stock number. And we further raise concerns about the United States Supreme Court joining Cameroon and Nigeria and Egypt as anti-models. Uh, uh, and according to Justice Kennedy's clerk, um, that was a, a deeply persuasive argument. Um, now, this is anecdotal, but uh, Harold Coe seeds all of the Supreme Court justices with clerks, and so uh, he was all over which arguments were working or having traction and which ones were not. Second argument, translation into the domestic. absolutely essential to situate the issue in a domestic tradition. The Mary Robinson, Harold Coe brief in Lawrence versus Texas does a masterful job of noting that foreign and international law echoes domestic understandings of decisional privacy, relationship privacy, and zonal privacy. And here, I would not argue that advocates opposed to the death penalty cite to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, an aspirational document, as a recent Colorado attorney did. Um, uh, instead, I think the more effective strategy is to ground the foreign comparative in international law in 
in a principle that finds traction in well-tested domestic traditions. As a corollary to this, I think that that domestic tradition is going to be more amenable to foreign imports and it is interpreting something like what constitutes cruel and unusual punishment or what is a dignity-based interest than it is the interpretation of a specific statute. So to the extent that Hobby Lobby addressed whether an employer, a private employer could refuse to uh, provide contraceptive coverage under an amendment and a, and a side interpretation of Obamacare, it was a particular statutory inquiry. Um, and I think that the foreign and international law has enjoyed greater uptake in those cases involving a big open-ended principle than it does uh, statutory interpretation. And finally, I think this is an appeal to judges. Judges are curious about how other judges interpret the world. Now, a question like whether two people of the same sex can get married, there is no dissonance or gap in understanding. So the Canadian and South African and Argentine judges adjudicating that question were speaking directly to Justice Kennedy and uh, Justice Breyer on the issue of what is same-sex marriage. Uh, they have confronted the same arguments, that there is a appropriate rationale for limiting uh, marriage, uh, civil marriage, to opposite sex couples. And they had uh, cited US law, particularly the Massachusetts decision. Um, and there is a kind of transnational dialogue going on of and between judges. Contrast what New Zealand's parliament did recently after the mosque uh, massacre. New Zealand's parliament didn't look to any other country's exemplar in banning uh, high-powered assault weapons. Right? Um, and in fact, I looked at the uh, six hours of debate transcript. There is not a single reference to what any other society has done. I think judges are more capacious in their understanding, more curious, and feel like they have the scope and authority, particularly in the Anglo-American tradition, to uh, learn from the experiences of other jurisdictions. I want to leave this presentation with three questions that I'm grappling with. And uh, uh, not to shape your questions or comments, but I could use feedback on these Number one, how empirical should this article be? Um, I have a fantastic research assistant. Um, I have some life experience litigating transnational cases, but uh, I'm reluctant to engage in an enterprise of looking to, at hundreds of transnational cases and trying to uh, establish a data set that would determine when the arguments are more effective than that seems like a political science project, and frankly, I, I, I'm less empirical in my orientation. Um, but I don't think, you know, gleaning principles uh, from three or four cases is enough, and because I'm not named Cass Sunstein, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, how that will land uh, when I publish. Number two, if experiences of other states matter, which states matter? Um, Justice Breyer was pilloried in a debate at uh, Washington College of Law, AU's law school, by Justice Scalia for citing a Zimbabwean court. Frankly, uh, the courts in Zimbabwe are fantastic, and they're the only bulwark against authoritarianism. But um, uh, Breyer admitted that it was a mistake to cite Zimbabwe for anything. Um, uh, and provided ammunition to his critics that uh, we are better and different than Zimbabwe and we ought not to be uh, citing them. Forget for a minute that uh, many Zimbabwean judges come from Oxford and are casebook authors of material that is cited by our Supreme Court. Um, he recognized that the optics of that were not good. But I do think it is different uh, to cite the Canadian Supreme 
support for uh, another uh, venerable body, and my question is, uh, which comparator is better? And the third question really has to do with subject matter. There are certain kinds of cases more amenable to comparative or foreign experience analysis. Uh, so I welcome your thoughts, comments, criticism, and uh, thank you for having me here. So when I, you know, heard you and, and read your things earlier, I just kept thinking about, you know, I kept thinking about this from a psychological standpoint because it really, to me, and it's not the only lens, but to me, it's ultimately a psychological question: what's going to be persuasive and why to this audience of these judges? Um, and to to me, the psychology, and you actually get at this in some of what you talked about today. I mean, it. To me, it ultimately is going to have a lot to do with just who are those justices? You know, if you're talking about our Supreme Court, it's not at all surprising to me that in some cases they do and in some cases they don't look to the international law, not so much for these very big picture principled reasons that you're talking about, but for much more petty pragmatic reasons like, you know, is it going to help the argument or it's not going to help the argument? Or I think you're also right that it could be that certain justices from their background, their Catholicism, or for whatever reason they have a deep-seated either an embrace of looking to foreign stuff or hostility to look to foreign stuff. So Scalia, in the one case at least, I don't know if that was more uniform, you know, this was like, no, we can never ever look to foreign stuff. Whereas other justices do seem more inclined to look to it. So. I think some, to some degree the psychology is going to bring you to the same place. For example, you know, what the psychology of persuasion would say is that um, statistics are not usually very persuasive, stories are much more persuasive. So if that would you know, kind of be a parallel to your own conclusion of you know, 25 countries versus 14 countries, that's not a very persuasive thing. Right. But it might just be a rich vein for you to pursue this oh, bottom line of comment. Yeah. And I, um, I've been thinking about this in terms of I would call it psychology of sovereignty. But uh, think about the New Zealand debate recently. Um, there was a sense in which an Australian came to New Zealand to massacre um, Muslims at prayer, and that part of the enterprise of parliament was to reclaim uh, sovereignty over the issue of gun rights and to speak for the nation as a whole. And to do that by subordinating the national interest to uh, a foreign story, I think would have been uh, almost offensive, right? Um, uh, in part because the killer um, was clearly speaking to an international audience and trying to um, pick up on ultra-nationalist uh, trends that have deep expression in other societies. Um, yeah, I, I think that we're talking about how do you persuade judges to do something that is unfamiliar. Um, in my experience domestically, judges do not like to be told that they don't have jurisdiction over a particular issue. Um, a, a, an ineffective argument is you can't hear this controversy. Um, in fact, I've been in court and won otherwise losing cases because judges are like, I don't think I can hear this case watching me, right? Um, particularly Article 3, life tenure judges. Um, and I think the, the psychological component is key, and I agree that um, we're talking about master narratives and which stories appeal and which lenses appeal to judges. And um, I've got to think that a, a transnational problem being adjudicated by a high court in a given country um, is more likely to uh, benefit from a very similar story uh, adjudicated by a similar position authority. And that's got even more than uh, psychological appeal. It has 
a kind of tradition or custom of Okay, so very interesting. Want to hear more and more. Uh, I have many questions, which I can't quite articulate in specific questions, so maybe I'll just pre-associate for a minute. So uh, first of all, I want to know how much of an outlier is the United States? I mean, do other countries... It's a huge outlier. It is a huge outlier. I mean, we are traditionally an example of American exceptions. Um, other states have all sorts of practices, uh, seminars. Um, Yale Law School runs a constitutional seminar every year for high court judges from around the world who are basically like learning from each other on uh, you know digital privacy, on intellectual <coughs> property, on reproductive rights. There's a theme each year and they go there to learn about the decisions, particularly in the developing world, that they're not going to hear about on Lexis or Western. Um, and so Breyer goes to that annual seminar but a very few other uh, Supreme Court justices do. And he's the outlier within a court that is an outlier among other high courts. That's interesting. And Anne Marie Slaughter has written extensively about this, uh, this practice of how judges learn from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's interesting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for the empirical qu question, yeah. so brutally, uh, uh, sort of brutally reductionist, there's a common law tradition, there's a civil law tradition. Right. They are both transnational within their spheres. Right. Uh, I'm curious how often they cross-pollinate, if at all. I Meaning, one thing I would be curious about is, yeah. do the common law judges basically listen to only common law uh, other nations? Yeah. And is that, do they stay in their lane? Right. I, I know much more about the common law tradition, obviously. And um, uh, not only do the common law judges stay in their lane, but there are, uh, there's the big four, you know, like when you go on safari, you know, there's the big five, you know, so the, uh, uh, the big four are now Canada, Australia, uh, UK, or House of Lords, and South Africa. And uh, there are lots of citations to the big four, uh, much more than, you know, Pakistan's very politicized Supreme Court or smaller Caribbean countries or uh, East African nations. Um, and it is, it's interesting that the, the common law world has sort of reinvented itself as a, uh, a highly cross-referential society. I, I've worked on indigenous land claims where courts have stayed proceedings pending something happening halfway around the world. So like they want to know in Belize or in Jamaica, what's going to be happening in Australia or India that month? I, I think that's really interesting. Is there a civil law analog? Do you think? Uh, not only is there much less of that tradition, but the uh, civil law tradition has has gone in a different direction lately, trying to influence international or multinational tribunals more than. Uh, you're interpreting a code in the civil law tradition, and that is, I think, fundamentally a, a different exercise than gathering stare decisis from. But what's interesting is that it started with, with the same code, right? It all started with Justinian's code. The, right, but they, they're, they're now different paths. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you would know much more about that than well, I do. Yeah, but and I'm fascinated by the subject matter question because yeah. I bet that is, in large part, the answer. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm noticing. Um, that there is more cross-pollination in big open-ended questions involving things like equality, dignity, and liberty, or very narrow technical questions like banking law. And um, uh, in Morrison, which was the case about whether Australian securities purchasers could uh, rely on their version of uh, the 1933 and 34 Securities and Exchange Act. Um, uh, no problem looking to what other states have done uh, on that exact same technical interpretation. You see, that, that doesn't surprise me because the answer is always history. Right. And, uh, <laughs> Legal history. Right? And there you might find sort of Lex Mercatoria right. alive and well right. today in a sense. 
but the statutory questions of Obamacare or uh, uh, the exclusionary rule in other countries are, are these kind of in-between uh, first principles cases or technical <coughs> And last one I promise, and I'll stop, Ruben, is, and there, you threw me a curveball with BYU, because then there's this Judeo-Christian gloss that just complicates everything that might also be transnational in its own unique way that is, is fascinating, which I never thought of before. Uh, yeah, and if you, uh, so here I'm just going to be fully transparent. Um, uh, I have worked closely with Harold Coe on a number of these cases, and we have adopted a model that less is more. So we are part of this trend of small, influential amici rather than huge lists of every organization that lines up on your side of the issue. Um, and uh, BYU goes in a very different direction. So there were 139 European, mainly Catholic university professors talking about uh, theological and uh, <coughs> Catholic legal traditions in Europe um, for their views in Hobby Lobby and Tobopurga. professors and organizations are not nearly as influential as the folks we have on my side, uh, if you will. But, um, oh, and by the way, Vicki Jackson at Harvard is the, uh, she is the leading centrist transnational scholar. So, like, everybody wants her on their brief. Um, and she was appointed a special master in the Prop 8 case and uh, Hobby Lobby as well. And, and so, uh, and she writes, in her book um, about engagement, which is a totally neutral green chicken shit term for, uh, <laughs> for how we're doing this work. Right? Um, uh, and uh, it, it's interesting. I, I think a lot of these conservative, particularly Catholic institutions, want to be on the record um, as having uh, discomfort publicly with changes in society. And interesting that um, you know, I, uh, Wyoming is about 20% Mormon, and uh, I teach public international law, and a lot of my students have come back from missions. So it's no accident that BYU is interested in the international sphere. Um, they just have a very different class. Uh, and I think it's fascinating that um, they have quieted the critics of using international authority on the in the conservative camp. And like now their voice, they, you know, I think their view, uh, I don't, you know, hang out with them and talk a whole lot, but uh, they, um, their view seems to be, if you can't beat them, join them. And, um, and nobody is saying that foreign and international law is immaterial. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. I have a quick comment about Question. Uh, why is it almost 40 years ago, but I still love practice? Uh, the Ninth Circuit at that time came out with a, some kind of a little statement to the effect that unpublished opinions weren't law. And that prompted a bit of a debate. And in our law firm, at least, we went ahead and cited it anyway on the premise that if they told a story and they were persuasive, they were persuasive precedent whether they were quote unquote law or not. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and I think that this actually with this whole thing. The other thing I thought uh, was interesting was that uh, just as clear, you know, they don't want to cite any other sources. Uh, in Romer, made almost an identical argument that opponents of the Civil, Civil Rights Act of '64 made, and. It just seems to me it was implicitly kind of a uh, reference, referencing back to, the, uh, to that kind of an argument. Uh, and, 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 and that was really not rooted in American constitutional law or anything. So uh, the, the argument that, that it's illegitimate to cite sources beyond the American Constitution just seems to me to be borderline silly. Right. Well, I uh, Justice Scalia 
at the American Society of International Law actually qualified his Roper comment. And he said, uh, I'm an originalist, and I cite foreign <coughs> law. It's just the law of the UK. And it, it's the law that was in place in another jurisdiction before we came into existence. So, um, interestingly, in the three Guantanamo Bay cases, Boudaï, Hamdi, and Hamdan, um, he is consistent in holding that the writ of habeas corpus has a pre-United States history. He cites uh, to the Magna Carta, uh, James Oldham at Georgetown uh, fashioned a brief on habeas uh, to Scalia that he, that he heavily adopted um, in those Guantanamo cases. And I thought that was an interesting use of legal history. And um, it allowed him to uh, marry his hostility to foreign and comparative law from the last 240 years with his uh, frequent invocation of uh, the original texts. Um, and I think on the unpublished decisions, uh, <coughs> you were clearly ahead of your time. I mean, it doesn't matter whether opinions are published or unpublished. In fact, in immigration law, as some of you may know, uh, the immigration law listserv is peppered with uh, this disseminating effort to publish by pushing out all sorts of decisions that are then cited be, even though they're not published. Uh, because we know that uh, they're influential. And it, it, actually, uh, last night, I, I was getting ready for today's talk, and I wrote down um, all the vocabulary that has been used by the Supreme Court twisting itself in knots to say that foreign and comparative law is not binding, but it's something else. So it is influential, it is persuasive, yeah. it is instructive, it is educational. Um, the list goes on for all of these terms that mean that you can use it or ignore it uh, as you wish. Um, but how to marshal that body of material and in what kinds of cases is an open question. And now that this is being actively done, at least in the legal academy, I thought I might uh, say something about when it seems to be more effective than at other times. Hi, yes, thank you. This is really fascinating. Um, I um, take you up on your question about subject matter um, and the Eighth Amendment in particular, the death penalty question. So I was unaware of the movement on conservative side towards accepting the kind of transnationalism. Um, but I'm wondering if that is going to be an interesting area to keep close uh, um, eyes on, just because it's not going to line up the same way as the Rigafell, since the Catholics uh, uh, theoretically are on order from uh, you know the Pope. And I mean, the Catholic position on the death penalty is against the death penalty. Right. So, so both sides of both sides of interest there in making transnational arguments maybe coming out the same way on it, looking at other countries like Ireland. I mean, it's just a, a thought, but so that's on one side, you can imagine more movement there for political reasons and where those political sites derive their, um, their ideas and thoughts. But on the other side, like the Eighth Amendment to me has sort of, the justices have really written it into a box they can't get out of in a way that isn't true about the 14th Amendment, or right. isn't true about, um, uh, you know, so whereas the rest of the world is talking about dignity and right. punishment, we've written it out, you know, and right. we're trying to get it back in. So I wonder if that would, is going to be a, Yeah, I mean, I uh, we could talk for hours about the contradictions in what I perceive to be the conservative <coughs> camp's arguments about, I have a feeling like these BYU professors will not go to the same lineup of Catholic jurists in Europe for uh, arguments around the death penalty in the future, um, and that they have an agenda, and they are cherry-picking international arguments and exemplars that serve their view. And the question is whether we're doing the same thing on our side of these cases. Um, I think we are, but I'm trying to suggest that we're doing it in, you know, with style or principle in ways that um, uh, my adversaries may not be doing, and and that could just be 
disclosure, that could just be a self-justificatory uh, exercise. Um, uh, I will say one more thing about the... Uh, we are in a really globalized, transnational world. So the day after Hobby Lobby was decided, um, the dean of the Opus Dei Law School in Santiago in Chile published an op-ed basically saying, that's it, no more contraception in Chile. Like, we have now been blessed by none other than the United States Supreme Court. And, uh, I mean, the Chilean context is totally different, but um, in real time, in the public arena, these legal arguments are being used and adapted. So I would suggest that uh, what we do has outsized uh, influence, and that um, I think the BYU professors are right that this is a trend or a gene that can't be put back in the bottle, and that they are now participating in the conversation rather than insisting that uh, judges have no right to say outside of the Thanks again for your talk and for your paper. Uh, first, I do have a comment that's going to segue into a question. So um, one thing about the whole BIYU conservative cap is that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the reason why the majority of countries still have some pretty um, like uh, bad laws in terms of LGBT rights and such is because of the history of British colonialism, that those old common law uh, colonial codes are still on the books in a lot of these countries. So in some ways, it is a remnant of colonialism. Which then gets to kind of um, the question, because you, know, you asked, you know, who should uh, we be following? And if the big four are uh, Canada, UK, uh, South Africa, and uh, Australia, uh, doesn't it just become another type of self-propagating colonialism in terms of these are the attitudes of these countries that are just uh, perpetuating among themselves? If they are, if we're now saying, well, okay, these are the ones that people are going to cite, and uh, it's going to just uh, proliferate among itself so that it's going to continue to marginalize other places like Zimbabwe or um, parts of Asia and, and such. Well, this uh, bleeds into the subject matter question um, from before um, quite nicely. Um, we are definitely seeing a, a retrenchment of a very conservative position on the LGBT rights in the developing world, and it's a violent and persecutory uh, uh, trend, right? Um, and uh, uh, likewise, on capital punishment, uh, there were a bunch of countries in the Caribbean that withdrew from the Privy Council because the UK had abolished the death penalty, and they wanted the death penalty for drug trafficking and a homicide. So Trinidad and uh, Jamaica and a bunch of other Caribbean countries um, have uh, institutionally objected to the new mandarins of the uh, UK. And um, uh, it's interesting. In one instance, they are taking the colonial heritage of anti-sodomy laws and uh, investing that with uh, new Uh, legal capacity, and in other contexts, they are saying, uh, "You can't tell us what to do. Um, we we don't like your modern, uh, we don't like your jurisprudence, or we don't like your statutory legacy." Um, I think, it, it, in a sense, it is all politics. Um, India's uh, decision on the now infamous or notorious Section 377 uh, anti-sodomy cases are is really interesting. Um, and uh, uh, I think it is clear that the big four are producing a kind of globalized jurisprudence that other states are not, and that there is a backlash to that, to that new trend as well. So this is very intriguing, particularly, I think, in the context of a world that seems so much turning inward so much, some nationalism on the rise in the United States and in other countries. And so the idea, this, uh, this talk and the title of, which can basically rephrase, transnationalism, transnationalism is winning, 
right? right? Uh, is very intriguing given all these other trends that we see in the context of the world today. Um, so I guess the first question I have is really about um, how is that counted, right? You know, we talk, you talk, is this a descriptive or, or an explanatory paper or is it normative? Like, what is the, I guess strategic, I should say. Right. What is the best way to make sure that transnationalism is taken seriously, right? And, and so that's a strategic question, right? right. But, but the explanatory question or the descriptive question of, you know, is transnationalism winning, I think, is still right. to be measured, right? And it may not be, of course, this <coughs> long, big, data set or political science kind of, but I think that the, I guess I'd go to your third question about what empiric should we use to try and determine like right. this trend, right? And I guess the first one that seemed to me uh, would just be, are we seeing more citations to foreign law, you know, on a, on a, on a continuum, not just in the Supreme Court, but, you know, in, in all, all of the federal courts, let's say, or some, some uh, data set. And, and then uh, the question might be, where is transnationalism going? Right. Um, on this Supreme Court, right? And so to that, of course, I ask you to opine about Justice Kavanaugh, uh, Justice Gorsuch, you know, right. and, and, and Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, in terms of where you think they're going to be headed in this, in this, in this continuum. Well, I, I actually think that uh, in a world of inward-looking ultra-nationalism, where states are adopting strongly sovereignist views on contentious social topics, I think this paper has particular relevance because now we're asking uh, when does one authority cite another one when they don't have to, when they are not linked by some shared enterprise. Um, I'm not expecting the Hungarian or Polish ultra-nationalist uh, captive Supreme Courts to suddenly start looking outside of their borders for solutions, but I, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the, uh, the borrowing and migration of ideas is defined or confined to some areas and proliferates in certain areas and not in others um, in that world. Uh, there's another conversation going on, which I think you alluded to, and that really is uh, how are ultra-nationalist societies or renationalized societies responding to international institutions? And um, can they really withdraw in a globalized world? Um, but the European conversation has a lot to do with uh, trying to get out of the European Court of Human Rights, which used to be the anti for getting into the common market. Um, you had to join the court, and now a bunch of illiberal Eastern European countries plus the UK are chafing up, uh, uh, against that. Um, I think that's a similar dynamic to what's happening in regional authorities um, and uh, some countries don't want to be governed by the international or regional level anymore um, and, and that's a somewhat different inquiry as to which uh, ideas are adopted by undisputed interpretive authority at the apex of different countries. Do we get any tea leaves from the hearings, or at least the early opinions of Gorsuch and Kavanaugh in terms of where they might be going with this? Um, uh, well, I think Chief Justice Roberts, um, as I note in the paper, is suspicious of the transnational borrowing. And he, uh, he joins Jeremy Waldron some others in saying that this is just like looking out over the crowd and picking the hats out of the friends that you like. I mean, there's, there's no uh, principle to this practice. It's just, uh, you know, now that Westlaw carries decisions from St. Lucia, we can, you know, uh, we can cite them at will. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there was a very interesting case in 2005 which uh, Roberts actually opined at length on what he was doing. And he, it's called Sanchez Yamas, and it has to do with the exclusionary rule. And he basically says, liberals are going to have to own the fact that we are different in terms of criminal law than other societies, and that US exceptionalism can be good at times and uh, can reach results that liberal internationalists don't want at other times. Um, international courts don't have the hearsay rule. They don't have uh, the exclusionary rule. They are um, 
oriented in the, with the same suspicion that our institutions are. Uh, and I, I, think, uh, I think he is likely to be a more consistent, um, selective borrower than uh, the newer justices of the Supreme Court. Um, you know, I, I say this as a Yale Law grad, but uh, I think Justice Kavanaugh is um, complicated figure. Um, and I think that Justice Gorsuch, uh, from my district, from the Tenth Circuit, and he is going to inaugurate a new law school building on our 100th anniversary uh, next so um, <laughs> uh, I think that um, he really does see himself in the Scalia mold, and uh, he's authored a couple of opinions already on uh, criminal justice matters that are more progressive than you might expect from but I don't expect him to be a transnationalist. Um, and uh, and I, I would love to talk to Justice Breyer, who, um, I mean, O'Connor was a strong transnationalist, and going to the, uh, Rehnquist would go to the seminar in Austria every summer, and some of you are more familiar with that than I am, and be involved in this judicial dialogue, and I don't think that was just because it's lovely there in the why, <laughs> because he was quite interested in that conversation. Um, uh, no indications yet that Justice Gorsuch is doing that. Um, uh, the other thing about Justice Kavanaugh is, I think he was in some ways brutalized by the process, and I'd be curious to see. Uh, he does not want to take an abortion case in the next three years. Um, uh, he does not want to take an abortion case while Susan Collins is still uh, a sitting senator, um, and I and you're starting to see that already. Uh, he he is uh, not voting to grant cert in contentious cases. So I uh, I, don't, I don't think we know enough yet about um, his practices. Uh, um, I think we know a lot about ourselves and our society <laughs> based on his confirmation process. But I don't think we know much about his church. about a question about the state, uh, what state we should look at. Um, I don't see any problem of looking at like Zimbabwe. Like, the, I think the only thing that really truly transnational is logic and reasoning. So should we actually look at the fact instead of the country, which the opinion is from, to actually you know, maybe migrate so the logic is over? Um, well, I think uh, alluded to this, I think that the, the lex mercatoria, the, the private law borrowing, is, um, is deeply rooted in all societies, and certainly the problem solving and logic of small scale debates is, is significant. But there's an optics problem when it comes to public law matters from countries that are really basket cases, and um, uh, I think as I said, I, is that us? Are we in that now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I, I do believe that we're. Um, uh, I know that Justice Breyer regrets uh, the symbolism of his uh, looking to public law in a society without a lot of the fundamental legal infrastructure that uh, we have here. And I think that's why. I, I'm asking the question of which comparators are uh, are going to be more influential going forward. But like he is granting for doing it, or he is granting for being part of doing it? Clearly the latter, but maybe the former. Thank you so much.